Hi. A few weeks ago, we posted a couple of videos on solid state refrigeration and we demonstrated the performance of our mini fridge. Since that time, we've completed the solid state freezer. It's similar in its shape, and a lot of the design of the box itself is very similar, except in this case, we used a solid door because it has a little bit better insulating properties. It is slightly larger, but more importantly, it incorporates a remote cooling option where we've taken some radiators and some low-speed fans, and we've pulled the heat off the back of the freezer using a reservoir, some pumps, and surplus uh, computer cooling radiators. In addition, we've placed this entire setup, this stand, on this table over here because we want to be near a window where we can splice into the return line that goes back to the refrigerator and potentially dump some additional heat outside to enhance the performance and the efficiency of the refrigerator. We'll get to that video in a short while, but uh, one of the major issues about using thermoelectric coolers is their very low efficiency and you have to do everything you can to try to mitigate that to try to make them as efficient as you can. A number of um, viewers had commented about the graph that I showed at that time showing that the greatest efficiency of these devices occurs when you have the lowest temperature differential across the faces and so the suggestion has been made to use several TECs in series in order to reduce the differential per stage and therefore enhance the efficiency. It doesn't work and I want to explain the principle behind why it doesn't work and in order to do that I've got to show you some graphs. Now the graphs I'm showing you here uh, are representative of this particular TEC which is a 12710 and is very common. It's very inexpensive. You can obtain these in single quantities for as little as three dollars a piece and in larger quantities even slightly cheaper. The graphs here are important because you have to learn how to read them in order to be able to calculate how you're going to have your system perform. So I'm going to go through a little bit about how you should read these. For the purposes of what I'm going to talk about today, we can ignore these two graphs. They have nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about. We're going to be looking back and forth between these two graphs. If you look at the colored lines here, each of the different colors represents a different current running through the same device. And so if, for example, you look at the pink line, what you'll see is that for a particular temperature differential along this pink line, you will obtain different amounts of uh, heat pumping capability and as you continue to increase the current you get more heat pumping capability but obviously these things begin to approximate because as you get to higher and higher currents these devices become quite inefficient. Now if we were going to run these in series what we need to do is we need to start at some place and what we'll do is we'll start with the 4 amp line which is this pink line right here and let's assume for a second that we're going to try to pump 18 watts out of this uh, refrigerator or whatever we're trying to cool. So if we look at this 18 watt point on the uh, heat pumping uh, axis, the vertical axis, and we travel over to where the 4 amp line intersects that, we'll see that we end up with a temperature differential there of somewhere around 33 degrees centigrade. Now if what we do is we then go down to the bottom graph on the right hand side, you can see that if you look at that same temperature differential of about 33 degrees and you travel up to the 4 amp line, you see that this device at this point will consume about 7 volts. 7 volts 
at 4 amps means that we're going to be using 28 watts used. As we said, we're pumping 18 watts. And the temperature differential that we described here was approximately 33 degrees. So delta T equals 33 degrees. If we take a second TEC, the first one, and then we stack a second one, the bottom one is going to still need to move the 14 watts. But in addition, it's going to also have to move the 28 watts that the first one used. So we're going to actually have to move 46 watts with this second device. So what we do is we go back to the 4 amp line here, and we travel along this line until we get to 46 watts of pumping. And that comes in right about here, which generously I would say is about a 5 degree temperature differential. If we look at that 5 degree temperature differential, we go back down to this graph, and we look at a 5 degree temperature differential for the 4 amp line, you can see that we're using roughly about 5 volts. 5 times 4 is 20 watts. So in this case, 20 watts used. We are still pumping the 18 watts through it, and we get a delta T equals 5 degrees. Now the total sum here means that we're using a total of 48 watts used in the series setup, and we have a delta T of 38 degrees. Now if we said, let's see if we can just do this with one chip. What we do is we go to the bottom right hand graph and we look at the 38 degree delta. These, this uh, x-axis shows that 38 degrees is right about at this line. And so if we travel up to a 48 watt line here, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to do a little interpolation. If we went to the 4 amp line here, and looked over here, we'd see we have about uh, 7.5 uh, volts or so, say 7 volts. So it's roughly similar to what it was on the other graph. And so therefore, this line here represents 28 watts being used. So 28 watts at 4 amps. And if we were to instead go up from this point to the 6 amp line, we would then travel over here and we would get to about mm, 10, maybe again generously, 10 volts. So 6 times 10, 60 watts if we were along this line. So 60 watts at 6 amps. Add the two together, we get 88. Get the average, we get 44 watts used at 5 amps. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at a line, imaginary line, that runs between the 6 and the 4. That's the 5 amp line. That's a line right between these. So let's go over to this graph here and imagine you have a line that's running between the pink and the blue, the pink and the blue, and that's a 5 amp line running up here. Now what we do is we go to that 38 degree temperature differential. We look down here at 38 degrees and we go up to that 5 watt line and we get right about here. We're above 18 watts of pumping probably close to about 20 watts. Now we've got 20 watts of pumping instead of 18 and we're using 44 watts instead of 48. Now you can play around with this. You can lower the voltage on the primary or the secondary. You can raise the voltage on the primary or the secondary. But ultimately, even if you try to optimize this and tweak this, you will always use slightly more power when you use these in series than when you use them as a primary chip. However, people familiar with TECs know that multi-stage TECs are not unheard of. As a matter of fact, you can buy them. The problem with them, though, is that they have a lower efficiency, but the advantage is they have a higher potential thermal differential because of the staging. If you look once more, one more time at that upper graph, you'll see that all these lines bottom out at a certain point. When you're using a certain amount of current, it can only get to a certain temperature differential before you're pumping no heat at all. In order to get to larger differentials, using staged units, you can do that. You'll get lower efficiency, but you can get to very high temperature differentials, and that may be what you're interested in. Now, when you find a commercial version of a staged unit, it often looks like a ziggurat, sort of a, uh, a tiered pyramid. 
And the reason for that, as we've shown, is that because you're adding electrical power or heat at each of the stages down the staged unit, the secondary, tertiary, quaternary TEC has to be more powerful. It has to pump more heat. Now, if you're willing to not quite optimize things, there is a very um, inexpensive and easy way to build a staged unit that doesn't require that kind of cost. And all you really have to do is to take, say, three identical TECs, and the base TEC is connected directly to whatever voltage supply you're going to be using. So all the voltage drop occurs in that one TEC. The other two TECs, which will be riding on top and will be connected to your cold source, are wired in series to the same voltage supply. As a consequence, these two have half the voltage drop and therefore will flow half the current of the underlying TEC. Thermal epoxy between these and you have a nice little stack. You can wire this up to simply two leads coming out of it. It's very convenient and you could do that for about $10. It's very effective, and even though you've probably lost a few percent in optimization, it's a nice alternative to buying, than, uh, to buying one of these other TECs. It's also a lot easier to mount. What we did is we went ahead and placed a stack of these in a little test rig that we set up over here. And in this rig, what we have is a lead weight that's holding down a top and inside there we have a small aluminum cube in which I've machined a little holder or a little uh, hole that can contain liquid and it has the same dimensions of the liquid cooling block that is on the bottom of the three TECs that have been glued and stacked on top of each other. The entire unit is then contained in this insulating uh, styrofoam box to keep uh, room air away from it. And then we've run a thermal probe out to a temperature meter. The flow of 50-50 ethylene glycol and water uh, is leaving the TEC and going into our reservoir from which it is pumped out and goes to an identical single four fan radiator that is being held outside of the building cools the ethylene glycol down to close to outdoor temperatures. So running it down to about minus three degrees centigrade and then bringing it back in and cooling the hot side of the TEC. As a consequence, the outside, the hot side of the TEC is basically outside. And the temperatures that we've been able to reach are remarkably low. Another thing to keep in mind is TECs work less effectively for any temperature uh, differential, the lower you're trying to operate both the hot and the cold side. Eventually, you can't cool liquid nitrogen anymore by using a TEC, for example. So to be able to get the kind of temperature differential that we see here, which you can, you can see, is pretty impressive and easy to do. And because the size of the TEC is identical all the way along its entire height, it would be easy to mount such a device, say, on a computer chip. And as long as you're using it at very low humidity levels, like, it, uh, like in the winter here, even though this line here is slightly below freezing, this line has no condensation on it. It's perfectly dry. So hopefully this was an interesting clarification to uh, a big question that everybody was asking and it was generated by the previous videos. But uh, if you'll be patient with us in a short while, maybe a week or two, we'll post the video on this uh, freezer and we'll demonstrate not only what kind of temperatures we reach, but we'll freeze some ice in there and kind of show you how cold this thing can really get. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Please subscribe because it really does help out the channel. And I wish you a very good evening. Good night.